regardless of why someone wants to find another individual, private investigators always have tricky obstacles to overcome. The first question you should be asking yourself is, should you even take on the case? There are tons of reasons why someone may ask you to do a missing person investigation, and many, or dare I say most, are legitimate reasons. But there are a handful of reasons that should be avoided like the plague, and I will discuss how to identify and handle those bad apples in a few moments. One of the big reasons we get requests to find people involves adoption matters. One case I had not too long ago turned out quite interesting to be sure. Back in the mid to late 80s, there was a young lady who met a daredevil kind of guy who she quickly fell in love with. He was the stereotypical guy who wore black leather, drove a motorcycle, had a hot rod car, and was also a musician trying to make it big. This young lady, we'll call her Doris, not her real name, met Jim, not his real name, at a bar where his band was playing. One thing led to another, and after a few drinks, after the bar closed up, the two of them left the bar, and the rest, as they say it, is history. This video is sponsored by OREP Insurance and Working PI Magazine. OREP is a leading provider of private investigator liability insurance. Visit OREP.org for a quote today. Roll forward about 30 years later, there was another young lady living a carefree life, raising a family of her own back east, but she kept having these desires to learn more about where she came from. Some of her friends convinced her to take one of those genealogy DNA tests to see where her family came from. Now, she already knew that she was adopted, but her parents didn't have a lot of information about who her biological parents were. They knew where she was born because they had her original birth certificate, so they knew her mom's full name and age, but they had no other information. The dad was not listed on the birth certificate, so that was a good sign that he was most likely out of the picture before she was born. So she took her friend's advice, took the DNA test, and started seeing some very interesting results. She started seeing a lot of cousins coming up in the northern Colorado area. As well, she found one connection that looked like an aunt on her mother's side. Now, she didn't want to barge into anyone's lives. She didn't want to become a nuisance to anyone, and she was a little overwhelmed and nervous about the entire situation. She had been doing some research, and she knew that a really good way to help get answers as to who relatives are and to make initial contact with them is through a private investigator. So she hired us to first do some backgrounds on the family to see what type of people they were so she would know if she even wanted to make contact with them. In doing those backgrounds, we quickly learned that her biological father was still alive. However, he was incarcerated in prison in another state doing a lengthy sentence. In fact, it was most likely he would never get out of prison. It also appeared he had no other children, or at least known children, that came up in any of our reports or searches. And the family up here in northern Colorado appeared to be pretty stable folks. Some of them even had businesses that they owned. In searching her aunt on her mother's side, we were able to ascertain that both her aunt and her mother had passed away already. She had also already found some siblings on her mom's side and had made brief contact with them, so she was primarily interested in her dad's side as she had no information about them. Her next request was for us to contact some of the cousins to see what lifestyles they lived and let them know about her and see if they were interested in having contact with her. I made initial contact by phone with three cousins and let them know why I was contacting them, but I was careful not to reveal her identity up front. Two of the three were very happy to hear about this, and in fact, they even said that they had heard that Uncle Jim, the client's father, had a child, but there was no other information. I also learned that Uncle Jim was the black sheep of the family, and no one had contact with him, nor desired to have contact with him. After giving the client this information, she then asked me to provide them with a phone number where she could be contacted. She used a disposable phone with an area code from another state besides where she lived to help keep some anonymity. A few days after passing this information on, I heard back from the client that they had made contact. Everything went well and they were planning on having a group call with more family members to make introductions. I later heard from her that she and her family were coming here to meet her newfound family. Now, this was a bit of a long-winded story, I know, but this is an example of how a lot of missing persons or locate investigations go. Not all end up with such happy endings, but the process of finding people is often the same from one case to another. 
Other reasons for helping a missing person or location investigation besides adoption revolves around health issues, a death in the family, as well as financial and legal matters, to name a few. So how do you as a PI handle a missing person's investigation? Do you even take them on? If not, why not? Let me know in the comments down below. In most cases, I will usually start with doing online research, the paid PI databases, or both, depending on how much information the client can provide me. In this case, my client had about a dozen cousins, aunts, and uncles' names, so it was pretty easy to tie them together. I first searched the county assessor's records to find properties some of them owned, and then did a secretary of state search to find potential businesses tied to them. I then had enough solid information I could run them in my PI databases and find the right people. I also got phone numbers, email addresses, and social media accounts from my databases, allowing me to do an OSINT, Open Source Intelligence Investigation, on each to help build some character profiles. Other sources I use during missing person investigations are the State Bureau of Investigations, like CBI here in Colorado, and the state court system to check for criminal and civil matters, both past and present. I can often take this information and then request the court files from the courthouse and many times I will find addresses or at least towns to help me out plus names of people of interest for me to interview. PACER, Public Access to Court Electronic Records, is another good place to find information on bankruptcies and other federal court cases. Those records will often provide some great intel on residences, vehicles, other assets, and attorneys' names. Don't be afraid to contact their past attorneys and ask them to pass on information so that you can contact the missing person. Now, I do this on a case-by-case -case basis, of course. Sometimes I don't want the missing person to know I am looking for them. I also make contact with local police departments. Many times, especially in cases where the subject may be homeless or living on the streets, the police may have had contact at some point. They can point you to where you might look for the person and provide you with aliases, descriptions, and other pertinent data. Obituaries are also a place to check. Most newspapers have some mechanism online where you can search the newspaper, and some even have an obituary search itself. It is unfortunate, but we have had many cases where we found out early on that the subject we were looking for was deceased. I would rather find this out early in my investigation so I'm not wasting my clients' money hunting down clues that have no real value. Other great places to check in with are homeless shelters, cold weather shelters, and resource centers for the needy and the homeless. Calling hospitals and mental health facilities is a good idea too. They will most likely not be able to give you much information due to privacy concerns, but they may be able to let the subject know how to contact you. I had another case where I got lucky when I went into a facility and I inquired about my subject, gave them my information. Then when I left, another man followed me out and told me he knew the guy I was looking for. Now this guy was hoping there was a little reward in it for him. He did give me some good information about where and when I could find my subject, so I did give him a few bucks for the assistance. And that guy who helped me is regularly on the streets and in shelters. I see him walking around all the time and I have used him on other cases too. Now you have to be careful when using CIs or confidential informants. They can provide great intel, but they can also blow your cover and provide you with false intel. To be sure, I do not take on every case that comes to me. This also applies to missing person investigations. I don't take on the ones where the guy, or the gal for that matter, is looking for their long lost lover, girlfriend, boyfriend, wife, husband, or whatever. These are disasters waiting to happen. Even if they just want me to make contact and pass on their contact information, I am usually highly skeptical. My worst fear is that I would wake up one morning and see on the news that a person I found was harmed or killed by my client. I always tell the client several things up front that help me vet out and ensure they have a legitimate reason for hiring us. While I can conduct the investigation, I always inform them that I cannot provide them with personally identifying information about the subject. This includes addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, places of employment, social media profiles, photos, videos of the subject, and other things. On occasion, I have worked for families doing welfare locate investigations on an estranged family member. In these cases, I will try to get a photo of the subject that I can give to the family, but only if it does not have anything like an address on the house, the person wearing a work uniform, vehicle license plates, things that would help them in finding the subject themselves. I also inform the client that part of our standard protocol is to run a background screening on them. 
the client to ensure there are no restraining orders or other red flags. And if we find any of these red flags, we are required to contact the authorities. I will then let the client know that we will contact the subject on their behalf after locating the subject. The client must provide us with a message which we will type up for them. After going through all of these prerequisites, most questionable clients will end the call and never be heard from again. But I also start checking the client out while they are on the phone by searching their phone numbers so I can get a name and oftentimes an address associated with them. Then I can do a quick search for arrests, warrants, things like that. If I find the information that leads me to believe that they may be attempting to find someone to do harm, I will contact the authorities after the call is over. Now, I had another missing person case not too long ago, and I made this video right here about that case, so check it out now.